everybody, and welcome to Backyard Farmer. I'm Kim Todd. I'll be your host for another hour of good gardening. Hopefully your plants have survived the heat this week, and I'm sure we'll get a few questions about that tonight. You can get in touch with us by dialing 402-472-1212 if you live in Lincoln. Toll-free number is 800-676-5446. Emailed questions in those JPEG pictures. Send those to byf at unl.edu. We answer them on a future show, usually not by email. We do need to know as much information about your issue as you can give us, including at least the county in which you live, please. Backyard Farmer is also available during the week on our social media network. That includes Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Pinterest. So, Tom, you're showing up tonight with something that is attempting to crawl away. It's crawling towards you, Kim. It is, and I love it. And I'm letting it go. It's not a spider. No. <laughs> They're faster. No. This is a white line sphinx. Uh, the adults actually are what we would call hummingbird moths. Ah, sure. That go to nectar and feed. This little guy feeds on a wide variety of plants, including uh, four o'clock that's in your garden, four o'clock that's out in the wild, uh, a few other plants. One thing that it does also feed on, which is actually, I think, good at least in my yard, is uh, purslane. Huh. So it can be somewhat beneficial. So you can identify these little hornworms by this little horn on its, where'd the camera go? <laughs> right when he <laughs> left. There's a little puppy dog tail on it right back here. You see that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that gives it the name. So interesting thing about these worms, they're really, they're, they're not prevalent enough to cause major problems, and if they are abundant, just pick them up and move them elsewhere, especially to your purse lane. And a little thing you can do if you're hungry is you can pull the head off, eviscerate them, and roast them on a stick. Lauren's probably done that. Mm. I would. Probably pull the head off. <laughs> I will now. I had no idea. I won't. <laughs> but You'll be looking for, that, for them now. Thank you for that recipe tip. <laughs> Put a little roasted protein uh -huh. in your purslane salad. You can spice it, too. <clears throat> Curry. <laughs> All right. Cajun spices. Yeah, Cajun. There you Even go. better. Uh, not. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Okay, Bill, you have uh, water things. I have water things here because despite the uh, two inches of rain that we got last yeah. night, which was great for us in and I know a lot of the state has been pretty dry. The drought monitor shows that we're developing drought across the state. So I'm guessing a lot of people are starting to water. I'm even having to water my uh, yard a little bit. And so um, I brought a couple different sprinklers here because a lot of people don't have underground sprinklers. And so we have kind of a diversity, if you go to the garden center, of different uh, sprinkler uh, types. And so the first one is really good for small areas. It's kind of just a spray head. Um, and it might only cover you know, a couple hundred square feet. And so that's important because if you leave this out for too long, it's going to start flooding the area out and running off and, and wasting water. So if you have a high clay soil, you might only get you know three quarters of an inch or a half an inch of water uh, down before it starts to pond up and run off. And so you may only want to run this uh, for a couple minutes, for maybe 10, 15 minutes before you have some flooding. Um, if you have bigger areas, then we'll use sprinklers like this. This is a Im typical impact sprinkler. Uh, it spins around and clicks and runs back and forth, and, and kids like to run through these and through these oscillating sprinklers. Um, you know, we generally prefer the, the impact sprinkler over the, uh, these oscillating sprinklers because the oscillating sprinklers, although they look pretty because they make a fountain of water into the air, um, that water is prone to evaporating, and so it's actually a lot more wasteful um, than these impact sprinklers that have a little bit more of a steady stream, and then that water goes... Uh, where we want it to be, and that's in our soil. So if you're looking for a bigger area, you know, putting some sprinklers like this together, these impacts, uh, is generally a little bit better than these oscillating sprinklers, unless you have, you know, a landscape garden, these might help for that. All right, excellent, thank you, Bill. Lauren, it is turf ickiness time. Great time of year for turf diseases, so <laughs> I don't have anything we can eat tonight, but uh, I do have a few grass blades here I wanted to show our viewers. Uh, brown patch is a very common disease that we have, uh, you know, just showing up now. This week of cooler temperatures is going to slow it down a lot, uh, but as we heat back up, uh, if you're seeing patches in the yard that have kind of a dark discoloration to them or, or smokiness in appearance or blighted areas, if you get down and take a closer look and you see these types of lesions where you see kind of these irregular uh, with dark margins in through here. Uh, this one up on the top, I'm trying to do this backwards, you can kind of see that's just the start of one, where it kind of has a smoky olive color, and then it'll progress into these other blighted ones. So uh, if you see this uh, on the individual grass blades in the lawn, uh, then you know you're dealing with brown patch. 
Uh, again, uh, this time of year, just try to keep those sprinkler systems, you're probably doing this, but early in the morning, that's more effective so you don't lengthen that window of leaf wetness to make it worse. Uh, you're not fertilizing, because Bill wouldn't recommend that this time of year, so I'm sure you're not gonna do that, because that would really aggravate it. And then there are several fungicides that will do a great job at controlling this if you really wanna keep your yard uh, nice and green. All right, excellent, thank you, Lauren. Mm -hmm. Kelly, that's related to something you can eat, but probably <laughs> not that, right? All right, um, I, what I, my sample is pod corn, and um, I, it was shared with me by one of my longtime master gardeners, Marilyn Schmidt from Bellwood, so I thank her for bringing this unique sample to me so I can share it. Um, pod corn, if you look very closely, each of the seeds are enclosed in kind of a leaf-like sheath, which we, we call a gloom. Now, corn is a grass, and almost all grasses, the, each individual seed is enclosed in, in, in a gloom. But corn, which is also a grass, regular corn, sweet corn, Indian corn, popcorn, and so on, um, actually has naked seeds. They're not in a gloom. So you can see very closely here that every single seed on there has that uh, sheath-like, leaf-like sheath to it. So pod corn, is, it's grown as an ornamental. And it's grown just like all kinds of corn. And these sheaths can come in many different colors, kind of similar to Indian corn. Uh, we have cream colored and purple here, but they can come in brown, red, white, and I even read where they can be checkered. So, and it's not, this has been around for a long time. This isn't anything new. Um, and for a while, the, there was some controversy. Was this the, the ancestor to uh, our corn? But they've since proven that it is not. It's actually the result of a mutation. And, but it's referred to as pod corn and used as an ornamental. So fun to add to your fall decorations. And, and Marilyn did tell me that she collects the seed and she grows it and it comes back true each year. Awesome, and we never have had that, at least in my spot mm -hmm. in this chair yeah. on Backyard, so that's really, really fun. Neat. Okay, Tom, you get the first picture. Awesome. Uh, this is a grower of grapes okay. here in Lincoln, and he has two issues going on, actually. Uh, he found these little dudes, which it, that's a great <coughs> picture, by the yeah. way, of the little dudes, <coughs> on his grape vines, and then he found grapes, uh, spots on the grape clusters. Uh, on individual grapes. So he's wondering what to do about the uh, little dudes and the spots. Well, the little dudes are what are called tree hoppers. And they're really neat. This is part of nature's <coughs> beautifulness, <laughs> is that, that there's this like expansion of the pronotum, which is this area right behind the head, which makes it look like a thorn. So these tree hoppers often are mistaken for plant parts and they, they have piercing sucky mouth parts so they sit still in one place and don't move much so sometimes they're overlooked. But this is a twice marked uh, tree hopper that usually you would find on like a uh, red bud hmm. as a common host and sometimes you get some wild grapes and apparently on grape in this case. Now it's really difficult to say if they're doing any damage. Uh, typically I cannot find anything that talked about control because typically they don't exist in numbers that are high enough to have to do anything about. So probably something like that you could hand pick it off and just dump it into a bucket of soapy water. Uh, the only damage they really do is when they're laying eggs. They lay their eggs right underneath the bark and then kind of split it open and insert their eggs and then the female kind of puts a, a cap on it and kind of becomes like a gooey looking thing which is really interesting too. But now to the berry. The berry is an interesting one because, I mean, it really depends on a lot of questions. How prevalent is it? Uh, have you seen anything feeding on it? Because it really does not fit a pattern of, of being fed on by any insect unless it had just taken a test bite, discontinued feeding, and um, maybe some sort of secondary uh, uh, pathogen was introduced at that point. But some other things that can happen could potentially be disease and it could also uh, be the result of, um, grapes are fairly sensitive to herbicide, especially plant hormonal herbicides that are applied and could be a response to that as well. Okay, so maybe he'll send us more if the, if the grape clusters themselves have issues and we end up in the path chair with it. Mm -hmm. Okay, turf. Turf. Zoysia. Zoysia, turf, <laughs> bring it on. So this started last year. Um, it's been getting progressively ver uh, worse. He thought it was grubs, no treatment, spreads to a larger portion. He did fertilize, he did grub control, he has an irrigation system, he mows. He's so doing things. He's doing things, exactly. Yeah. And this is in Omaha. 
Okay, so um, there's three things that can really kill zoysia this time um, from Milan. Uh, one is large patch, which is a disease. It's actually Rhizoctonia, just like the brown patch that Lauren just showed, but just a little bit of a different uh, version of that that goes for zoysia grass. But that we generally would see problems in the spring and the fall when the grass is starting to grow, and it should kind of recover. Um, but if we are worried about that, you know, don't overwater the zoysia. It's zoysia, you don't have to water it very much. So. Don't stop watering it. That would help eliminate that a little bit. Um, more likely, this is probably uh, an insect issue. Hmm. And so when we see it thin like that, um, it's probably um, a hunting or hunter bill bug. And so I'm not the greatest entomologist in the world, but uh, uh, it, they cause more of a diffuse uh, pattern like we saw in that picture, uh, as opposed to a chinch bug, which kind of decimate the whole zoysia la uh, lawn. Uh, and so if you think that's what it is, what you actually want to do is put a pitfall trap into uh, your lawn, so you cut a little hole, put a little pit, and then the uh, adults will fall into there. And they're very, very small. And they actually um, burrow through the stems and the rhizomes of the, of the, uh, the zoysia grass. Mm -hmm. And so it causes that kind of droughted appearance. So I would first look for uh, a proper diagnosis and, and actually find uh, the insects there, and then we can think about um, uh, management. And Jonathan Larson did say that they found a uh, billbug on bluegrass with one of our, our good lawn care operators mm -hmm. up in Omaha. So it wouldn't be a surprise to me. Okay, awesome. Could, just add just uh, uh, another symptom of it is when the leaf, uh, they chew into the leaves when they're all curled up. I don't know what the technical term is that. So they dump their egg in there, so then the larvae go down into the crown. But when those leaves unfurl, what you find is several holes in the leaves all in a line. Yeah, and, and they'll, they'll say if you pull the leave up, you can actually see, you know, there, there'll be hollow stems and um, the leaves will be hollow and they'll pull right off the ground where they, uh, they're uh, putting their eggs in the, the plant. So oh. I'm guessing that's what it is, but again, it could be one of those three things, honestly. Good oh, job, Bill. Awesome, excellent, guys. All right, <laughs> you have tomato issues here, Lauren, <laughs> um, and Pepper with kind of the same issues, but this tomato, he planted in the middle of May, he thought it was herbicide damage from drift, mm -hmm. but then pulled it up and found this amazing wonky thing on the root system and wondered what that is. And then your second set of tomatoes is those lower leaves and do we have some early blight? That's a different, this is a different viewer. Okay, so let's talk a few different things about tomatoes. So um, one thing with the, the, the root, if it was herbicide injury, you can actually have some root injury with some of our herbicides too. Um, but I, I really need to take a closer look at that one, Kim. Uh, so we can go back to that one there. Um, so with that one, um, I'm gonna be honest, I can't tell you for sure with that. It has a lot of darkness in the roots. If you've got something going on, if, is it in a container, do they say? Uh, yeah, it is. Okay, so one thing that can happen too in a container, depending on the history of that soil, is if you have something built up because you've got quite a bit of what looks to be like a root rot and maybe some you know, compaction going on in there or something, I don't know how it was planted. Uh, but look to see if you're overwatering in that situation, which would cause the root rot scenario. Uh, would be one thing. Uh, there are all kinds of nematodes and things that can cause root injury like that. Mm -hmm. um, but if it's in a container, I really doubt that's a situation. So I'd, I'd look for overwatering and look at your moisture control on that. Okay. If this is a seasoned gardener and that's not the issue, then we need to get a little more information on it. Okay. Uh, this one for the lower leaves, uh, we'll see a lot of different foliar diseases on tomatoes. So a couple recommendations on that, and there's no way I can tell from the small spots on the leaves on the lower spot like that which one it is. Uh, but just kind of try to remove those, uh, again, just to remove that inoculum is the best thing to do. And then, uh, you know, if you can do some mulch, but if that's in container, mulching isn't as important as just avoiding splashing that soil back onto it. And then next year, just maybe restart with some new soil if you got a lot of problems. All right, thank you, Lauren. Kelly, you get some mm -hmm. tomatoes too. Oh, okay. <laughs> and, and this one, Kind of looks like insect or bird mm -hmm. damage, but he wasn't for sure on this one. He, they did think they had some blossom end rot starting, so they did a little uh, eggshell stuff mm -hmm. around the base. And then um, the second one is tomatoes not doing well. These are in a couple different locations. New growth is curling, a little epinasty in it, but then they thought, well, what is this? Is this herbicide damage or what? So what do you think here? 
Okay, well, the photo we're looking at right now, I mean, when you first glance at it, it, it certainly looks a lot like herbicide injury, um, but there are some viruses of tomatoes that can look similar to herbicide injury too. So <laughs> you, it's really, you know, I really don't know for sure which one over the other. I lean towards herbicide just because of some of the way the way the veins are, you know, coming together and proliferating. Um, and the cupping and the curling. But the thing to do is to look around the yard, look around the garden, look around the yard. If anything else is showing any kind of distortion to the leaves, even if it's just a very minor amount, then you might lean towards that it's probably a herbicide injury. If nothing else, if everything else in the garden, um, other tomato plants, you know, in the row, nearby, uh, everything in the yard looks fine, then possibly a virus. But in either case, if it's a virus, then you'd want to pull it out. There's nothing you can do about it, right, Lauren? And you don't want to leave it in there. Um, and if it's a herbicide, we can't tell you that those tomatoes are uh, safe to eat. So we say play it safe and maybe get rid of it. But some people do choose to go ahead and eat them anyway. So our recommendation is don't eat any tomatoes that were on the plant at the time that a drift situation might have occurred. There didn't look like there were any on there anyway. So we need to go into our segment. So real quick, what is what was that spot? Do you have any idea? Uh, may, it didn't look like either, I'd say either tomato fruit worm or maybe hail damage or something such as that. Okay, all right, cut that out and maybe don't eat that either. Right, <laughs> or eat around Unless it. Unless you want the worm. Yeah. <laughs> well, in 2015, Mike Shambaugh Miller started a program called Produce from the Heart. Since its inception, Mike has been slowing the waste of fresh produce and helping alleviate hunger here in Nebraska. In a nutshell, what we do is we act as the bridge between producers, like farmers, community gardens, even small gardens. We're their bridge to uh, donation agencies such as the food bank, food net, uh, the gathering place, any type of a uh, free distribution center for individuals experiencing hunger. Connecting with produce from the heart uh, really gives us a chance to provide resources and just make more connections with people. Um, so we might know the food pantries or we might know, say, the backyard farmer garden who needs to get their produce somewhere, they just don't know how to do it. And so that's how you bring in produce from the heart. And what's really cool is that we can grow the produce, then NEP can come in and actually give really good recommendations on how to use that produce that we are growing. And having produce from the heart work with us and to pick up that produce and take it to where it's really needed has been a great benefit. If anything, it's that perfect storm period right now for this type of an organization that we have people who want to donate, we have people who want to uh, help uh, collect that produce, we have people who want to help deliver it uh, to places in need, and unfortunately we have a lot of people who need it. at a food bank each day helping distribute or bringing in produce. If he's not doing that, then he's probably on a weekend going to a farm, picking up all that extra produce and taking it where it needs to go. Mike brings to the table the knowledge of that food pantry, which we never really actually had. So he knows who needs it, what they need, and it's um, much more beneficial for us to know that it's actually going to where it will be wanted communicating to the farmers that you don't have to throw it away anymore. There is an organization that work with us will find a way to make sure that we can get it to someone who needs it. Growing an extra row uh, is always a good idea. If you have extra produce, and we all do, those of us who have gardens, so bringing that into the backyard farmer garden on Tuesday nights or Saturday mornings, so that can be taken to people who can eat it. I think, you know, backyard farmer is 65 years old this year, and it's kind of a great way to celebrate, knowing that we're helping them, they're growing the best produce they possibly can, they're growing in abundance, and having um, NEP, SNAP-Ed, 
and produce from the heart, it, it does just completely align. I mean, they teach people how to take that produce that we are growing, how to use it, what great nutritional values that has, and then having produce from the heart being able to actually distribute that to the local areas has just, it, it's kind of the stars all aligned the right way. So that relationship that we have with clients and with recipients is, is really strong and, and really, like I said, it, it keeps most of us going. You can donate your fresh, fresh produce to the Backyard Farmer Garden on Tuesday nights from 4.30 to 6.30 p.m. And for more information, please visit their website at producefromtheheart.org. That's a great program. All right, insects. These, yes. these guys, a couple, three people here, Tom. Small mounds have showed up in the south-facing front lawn. There were several suspect a type of Hymenoptera. Hmm. So what do we think is going on and what should they do about them? Hmm, let me see. <laughs> and it just about happened when cicadas started to yeah. go out and sing and sing their love song. So I would say cicada killers are causing this. So cicada killers, the females come out and they are looking for a place to make a nest. And this picture just shows a great, great spot, usually up against the sidewalk or some sort of barren area, nice loose soil, uh, sunny. So she'll go in there and actually remove several... Uh, a lot of soil to make these tunnels in which she will go out then get a cicada, she will sting it, it will paralyze the cicada, she'll drag it back into that burrow, stuff it in there, and it's still alive, she'll lay an egg on it, and right behind her middle <laughs> Sounds leg. like a horror movie. <laughs> Come on. Oh, it gets better. And so this little larvae hatches and starts to eat the cicada from the outside in, being careful not to kill it, so it's still alive and stays fresh until it completely consumes it. Then the little larvae pupates, and it's just going to sit in there the rest of the year until it will emerge as an adult next spring. Now. You're never really seeing the females. You're seeing what she's doing. She's the one that's carrying. She's doing all this work. Now, the males, though, are territorial. The female is not dangerous unless you grab her. Do not grab her, Bill. That's something you don't want to do. She will sting. But the male is aggressive. He's being territorial. And he's just uh, um, coming out to check you out. He's not going to do anything to you. So okay. if you want to discourage them, put a lot of water there. Uh, they'll leave. Maybe put mulch to cover bare soil. Um, and that would pretty much take care of them. And put up a sign if they're in your Kime court heart, Courtyard Gardens, which they yeah. are. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay, Bill, um, this is a Kentucky coffee tree that is suckering all over the yard, and of course we have other trees that do the same thing. She wants to know what can be done to get rid of the suckers. I'm answering the tree questions. Y well, it's in turf. <laughs> Look I know, at there. I know. I'm kidding. <laughs> um, we, I would avoid spraying any kind of herbicide um, because you don't want it to translocate and hurt that tree. Trees like Kentucky coffee tree or black locust that make these suckers from the roots uh, is normal. And so the best thing we can do is just keep up with the mowing and just continue to mow. Don't get too big and woody. Um, and it's just, it's a natural thing that you're gonna have to deal with, but I don't want to, I would not recommend spraying or anything like that because I would fear hurting that poor tree, so. Exactly, and they will do that if there is some sort of a, a root injury or if you dig one the up. Stress, and, yeah. Yeah, they'll do that. A lot of times when you cut them out, they do that. They do that. So. And then you they want to pop up in a putting green in North, in North Platte. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Great, <laughs> a little hazard. Mm -hmm. Okay, quaking aspen, Lauren. Uh, they noticed this thing on the north side of the tree trunk fairly large area, the limbs near it are dead and dying. They're wondering if it's a form of canker. It's about 12 years old. Uh, yeah, just from the overall picture, I think it's got a fairly sizable canker on it. That tree is unfortunately probably gonna die, so I would go ahead and replace it. Okay, or cut it down Sorry. and let it You could cut sucker. it right below and let it sucker maybe. It would come, well, it would sucker <laughs> it would probably, sucker. so if you cut it, you would have new ones come up. So new you could one. do that. Exactly. But that one's going out. <laughs> All right. Um, Kelly, this is a, an interesting um, willow. It's a Nikashi willow, <clears throat> excuse me, on standard. Inner leaves are beginning to yellow. Um, they had something else invaded with spider mites, so sprayed everything with a three-in-one insect disease and mite control. Then Japanese beetle arrive, then did Garden Tech seven concentrated bug killers. So we've, we've whammied away, but what do we think is going on with okay. the willow? Well, I, I think it's two different uh, things are going on here. I think the yellowing on the inside um, may possibly just be the tree adjusting to extremes in moisture in the soil or extremes in temperatures. 
Uh, sometimes they'll go ahead and yellow and do that. There's a slight possibility, since this is a grafted plant, that maybe there's some issue with that graft. Um, but there's not much you can do about that, and time will tell whether that's the issue. But hopefully it's just uh, the yellowing is just the plants adjusting to extremes in soil moisture, keep it consistent. My, I, I was a little bit concerned about the white on those leaves and wondering if there might not be some phytotoxicity from uh, multiple insecticide applications. Uh, the last one was seven, and sometimes with hot temperatures and so on, or if you overdo, overdo it, um, you can burn, get some phytotoxicity. So wait and see. All right, and those darn willows are not noted for their longevity anyway, so <laughs> unfortunately. Okay, we have time for, I think, a couple of questions before we go into our garden stuff. Okay. Tom, tomatillos, a grub-like insect, is eating the berry itself. Um, small brown grub-like thing, any notion? Um, Send a pic. Yeah, picture would be wonderful, but uh, just to guess, maybe it, it could be like a, a tomato fruit worm, hmm. possibly. Yeah, since they are related. Yeah. yeah. I don't know a lot of, I know we grew them in our garden once, but I, I don't remember anything. Oh, they're great in ch green chili. But of course they are. Yes. <laughs> okay, uh, Bill, this is a 7,500 square foot lawn. He wants to recede in the fall how much seed the lawn has some bare spots. We don't know where he is and we don't know whether it's fescue. Yeah, there's not, not enough information. If uh, tall fescue is such a bigger seed than bluegrass, so if depending on what seed you'd be going with or buffalo grass, it's going to be very, very different seeding rates. And so uh, contact a, a local extension educator and they can help you with that question. All right. Lauren, probably a follow up to your sample. So, the fungus among us, what do you use to treat it in the lawn? Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> as far as treatment on it, uh, any of our rhizoctonia diseases respond uh, really well to strobilurin fungicides as far as control, or even uh, if you're looking at, at some, it, you will get in the garden center that may have uh, uh, propiconazole, uh, would be another not as good, but just go to that garden center and, and when you're looking at control, just tell them you're trying to control brown patch and you will see a general turf fungicide that will do a good job. So there's okay. a lot of different, and I don't keep up with all the different products in the garden center, so sure. just ask them for that. But you know, in general, there's a lot of products that you could pick from and most of your products like that are gonna do a good job. And read the label. It's, it's a pretty, it's pretty wimpy when it comes to controlling it. Okay. And just good. read the label mm -hmm. on it. All right, thank you, Lauren. Okay, Kelly, uh, hail in Omaha again, and uh, hostas just riddled with, with hail damage, I anything they can do. Well, there, it seems like there's always some controversy on whether you should cut those off or not cut them off. So, I, have you ever tried it? I've never actually tried it, because I've never had to. I have. And they came back? No, yeah, not yeah. so much. That's that's what I hear. I tend to hear from people that if you cut them back, so most people will go out there and I mean they'll just let them be. Let you know because as long as there's foliage there, whatever green is there is photosynthesizing. <clears throat> excuse me, and doing what it needs to do for the plant. But any leaves, most people prefer to just individually hand pick or clip out the ones that are the worst damaged. Yeah, exactly. Well, we've been showing you a few examples of All America selections from our garden. For our Garden Minute, we have another really interesting vegetable that you might normally not associate with Nebraska. Here's Nebraska Extension Educator Terry James from the Backyard Farmer Garden. This week in the Backyard Farmer Garden, we're going to look at another All-America Selection winner for 2017 and see how it's performing in the Backyard Farmer Garden. This week, we're looking at an okra. This is a more ornamental okra, although it is edible. It is called Candle Fire. It's supposed to be about four foot tall. Obviously, as you can see in our garden, it is not reaching that potential. One thing you do have to remember when you are planting okra or wanting to grow okra in your garden is that they really do like high organic matter, which we do have in the backyard farmer garden because remember we are amending our soils every year. We did start it in the greenhouse, so we're not for sure if that's part of the problem. When we transplanted it out, it was a little late and it was kind of getting a little root bound. Might have been the problem. We're going to see how it reacts in our garden. Disappointed that it's not that tall, but we're going to see how it tastes. So stop by the Backyard Farmer Garden this week and check out the Candle Fire Okra. 
more bold and beautiful from our garden. Anybody here fond of okra? Grilled, it's great. <laughs> All right, we have a viewer who wonders whether drilling holes in the stumps of trees cut down and then putting Epsom salts in them will help get rid of the stumps. I have never heard of using Epsom salts that way, so I will say no, you dig it out, put a bunch of soil on top of it to keep it kind of moist and just let it naturally decay. There are other products you can try though too. All right. Um, the fall cool season vegetables, when can they be planted? And this is a carny viewer. Okay, well it depends on what, which one you are trying to plant, but most of them are planted, uh, they need to be planted here pretty soon but it does somewhat depend on what you're planting and then you look at the days to maturity and you wanna make sure that it's going to mature before the first average frost for your area. All right, uh, this is a Neely viewer wondering why his magnolias are starting to throw some flowers right now. Oh, that's usually a sign of response to some kind of a stress, usually abiotic stress like extreme heat, extreme moisture changes. Okay. Should be okay. This Johnson Lake viewer bought shrubs and containers on sale. Should he hold them or plant them now? I'd go ahead and plant them and, and just keep them moist and mulch. Hope for the best. Hope for the best. All right, thank you, Kelly. You ready, Lauren, like something? I've been eating a lot of smoked fish dip lately. <laughs> I really like smoked fish dip tonight. Oh boy, don't get near your breath. It's awesome. Okay. <laughs> Make it myself. <laughs> All right, we have an Omaha viewer who has powdery mildew on his turnip leaves and likes to eat the turnip leaves in salad and wonders if that will hurt him and or what does he do about it? N not aware of any you know toxicity in that but I would just be really careful because a lot of times if those leaves are blighted a lot there may be other surface molds and there are some that can produce toxins so I wouldn't eat any of the leaves that look bad. All right uh, this is a Wahoo viewer that has green beans and raised beds and they have rust spots on them. Ooh. Eat, toss, how do you keep that from happening? Uh, in the actual on the green bean itself? Right on the um, green bean. Yeah, I would just cut those out. I would cut the spots out. Okay. We have uh, a blade. Keep them from happening, though. You'd, you'd want to, I, I, it's hard to say exactly what it is, so we need to identify it. Okay. We have a Blair viewer that has powdery mildew on their garden flocks. Okay. Anything to do about that? Uh, powdery mildews respond to just overhead irrigation. So actually, if you mm -hmm. overhead water them, that will help, and I would try that first. Uh, sulfurs are also pretty good. Okay, this is a Hastings viewer that say their fescue went from fine to melted overnight. What was that? Could be brown patch like we showed earlier. I'd look down, get down on your hands and knees, look around for some lesions, and then try some management. Awesome, excellent, nice job. Okay, Bill, you ready? Uh huh. Uh huh. <laughs> <laughs> confidence, such confidence. I'm gonna win it. All right, uh, this is a viewer who wonders is it too early or late to seed a buffalo? blue grama combination. It's a great time, it loves the warm weather. All right. Keep it wet. Keep it wet. We have a Bayard viewer who says they have terrible tumble window, wind, little wind, windmill grass. What did, how do they control it and with what? I'm pretty sure it's tenacity. Okay. But I would double check. All right, so we'll get back to him on get that. Get back to me. Uh, this is a broken bow viewer who's, who wants to know when do they start killing slash tilling an old lawn to do the, the reseeding in the fall. Next week, we're doing it on East Campus. Perfect. Yep, bring it on. Um, we have a viewer in Lincoln who left the slip and slide on their lawn for oh. five days in the heat, <laughs> and they're wondering if what looks like toast is. Yeah, it's probably dead. Okay. Pythium, possibly other disease, or just suffocation. Okay. Yep. Um, so, the same buffalo grass viewer says if they seed that now and get a good stand, can they then spray 2,4-D for dandelions in October? I would be careful to 2,4-D, um, just because it can be sensitive, especially on the newer buffalo grasses. Um, there's other things you could probably use, like tenacity, that would actually kill the dandelions too and pretty safe on the buffalo. All right, excellent. Thank you, Bill. I went over a little bit. Okay, you ready? Okay, yeah, okay. yeah the one that was I'm ready. Yeah. So we have lots of questions about gray bugs of various sizes on the garden. What are they? <laughs> gray bugs of very, uh, possibly blister beetles. Okay, and how do you control them? Um, really good question. Smack. You don't want to knock them off by hand because they are blister beetles. So <laughs> um, if you can find a way to manually remove them without touching them, Wear gloves. All right. We have a Murray viewer who said her birch is being shredded by black or brown beetles, no green on them, hard shelled. 
any idea what those might be since they're not Japanese? The foliage? Mm -hmm. uh, it could be, um, it could be uh, June beetles, possibly. Yeah, and just they'll run their course. Yeah, okay. they'll run their course. All right. What sort of insect makes little tiny welts on green beans? Any idea? Oh, flea beetles. Flea beetles. Okay. So we have a viewer who says she has little sweat bees going in and out of holes in the mortar. Yeah. That... Solitary bees nesting. It's great. And they're not going to wreck the house. No, they're not going to hurt anything. Okay. Uh, Fairberry viewers. Oops, too late. I'll ask you that one later. There's still one. Good job. <laughs> Tom still won, <laughs> even yeah. though he made short, stuff short up. We yeah, know he made that short stuff answer. None of that's true. <laughs> all right. So, Kelly, we have some plants of the week oh, this that's week. Right. <clears throat> uh, all of them out of our backyard farmer mm -hmm. garden. Yep. Some, oh, some beautiful plants. Uh, everybody's probably wondering what this large white one is. This is Sputnik. It's actually, it's a button bush, and it's Sputnik button bush. And this is, you know, I, I love this shrub just simply because there's not very many shrubs that bloom this time of the year. It's blooming a little earlier than normal, um, but it'll start blooming uh, sometime in July and, and bloom through August. They have them out at state fairgrounds and they're always, uh, they're always blooming away even right at state fair. So, and it, it, this shrub can get quite large. Um, I, you know, I know I've read it can get up to eight to maybe even 12 feet tall, but, and the ones at state fairgrounds are at least that tall. Probably not 12 feet, but very interesting bloom. It does look like Sputnik. And they, they'll grow in, they're known for tolerating wet soils, so they're used in rain gardens, but they'll tolerate dry soil too. And if I'll turn it around here, this one is, I'm not familiar, I wasn't familiar with this, the one on the bottom here, uh, this purple. I'm trying to get it around. Over there, there you go. Um, China purple tube clematis. Trying to get a better look at it, but I'll just hold it still. And this is another uh, kind of a shrub like clematis, about four by four foot. Grow it in full sun to part shade. Um, it will seed itself. It's fragrant and has showy seed heads. So in the last one, the lighter pinkish lavender purple one is an Augustachi or hyssop. It's a good one for hummingbirds. But this one is heather queen, and it too will kind of come true from seed. It is a perennial. Um, long, as you can see, long spikes, and they can get up to 24 inches long. So we have great stuff for pollinators mm -hmm. and, and just a lovely combination. Yeah, the Sputnik the is good yeah. too. There's for, a new, there's a newer button bush on the market called Sugar Shack that's shorter, yeah. but we don't know how much shorter. So mm -hmm. we'll see. All right. Um, so we go to pictures next. Okay. Tom and um, this one. Let's see. Is Bagworms. That's bag your next worms. set of pictures. Ooh, look at those bagworms. And he um, he was really worried about this, and he did use uh, a systemic insecticide on it. But look at look at this picture. Yeah, I love it. So, do you want to talk a little bit about timing, or <laughs> it's all right on this? Yeah, it, it, bagworms. I mean, really, on a um, Conifer, it's more of a concern because multiple generations will defoliate it and really harm the plant deciduous, not so much. But the life cycle, you know, they'll, they'll start off in May, the eggs will hatch. Uh, they will start to, larvae start to feed, they cover themselves with plant material, they grow. In late August, the, they become adults. The male leaves, he has wings, goes find the female, and she's wingless, she stays in that bag, they mate. Uh, that bag just fills up with eggs, and then that spins the winter, which brings up some great control strategies. So one of the best control strategies, if the tree's not too big and you can get to it, is to go out before the eggs hatch in late May, pull them off the tree. Now don't just pull those bags off the tree and throw them on the ground, you need to destroy them. You can squish them or do anything else that gives you the thrill of the kill, but make sure you <laughs> destroy them mm -hmm. because otherwise eggs will hatch out of those little bags and they'll just reinfest the tree. The other thing you can do is potentially encourage biocontrol and studies have shown that if you plant uh, daisies, a few other flowers nearby trees that have an infestation, it will promote natural enemies which will go and control the, the bag worms. And then mm -hmm. of course there are uh, spray options which would include soaps and neem and um, insecticides, but you have to time this very carefully and try to get them usually in June before the larvae get too big, otherwise they don't respond well to uh, treatment. All right, excellent, thanks Tom. Okie doke, Bill, your picture three is 
uh, and this is turf, obviously, and this is path, obviously, but this is splotches of brown grass in the backyard and then noticed white fuzz on mm -hmm. the dying areas. Assumes this is some sort of mold or fungus, so what is the treatment here? Jeez, it could be a mold or a fungus. Could be. But uh, no, so this, uh, we really need to know what we're dealing with here. Honestly, uh, the three that are most common, brown patch, uh, dollar spot, weather's been pretty high, and then this is Pythium blight, which actually a water mold of the Omicete. Uh, they're all treated kind of with different products. And so if you really wanted to treat, uh, you'd want to know what you're dealing with so that you're using the, the most appropriate product. They all make these mycelial masses like that. And so, um, you know, get a diagnosis on it first before we go and, and start just spraying whatever, you know, anything under the kitchen sink to try to control them. All right, thanks. Okay, Lauren, shroom time. <laughs> great shrooms this week. <laughs> it is, great shrooms. So this, uh, let's see, this is a South Lincoln viewer. Has these in several locations, not sure what they are. Uh, moved the mulch back and then found the egg-looking things. That is great. Looks like a, I, I don't like snakes, everybody knows. I always thought it looked like snake eggs. I do I envision. <laughs> but uh, and you squeeze them, they're slimy, and if you cut them, they, they look like an egg almost. It's really neat. Uh, this is a slime, or uh, this is a stinkhorn. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, and these are the stinkhorn ovules that form underneath, and those will emerge. Uh, kind of a fun thing you can do. Take a few of them, put them in a little pot, and put them in on the table, and overnight, usually, they'll pop out. It's and then they stink. It's just yeah. really great in the house. <laughs> Most of them are spread, the spore masses are spread by flies. Mm -hmm. so they're attracted to that smelly smell. <laughs> Beautiful fungus. Terrible Beautiful animals. fungus. All right. No idea if they're edible. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, not. Okay. <laughs> Kelly, uh, this is the North Platte viewer. They have a clematis in pretty poor condition. She says it's been in place about two to three years. Um, bottom half is bare, very few weak leaves at the top. They mulch to keep the roots cool. There's a drip line. They spray rabbit repellent to ward off the wildlife. But mm -hmm. after three years, we have a clematis with one one sprout and six leaves. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, she mentioned that the bottom half looks like this. It'd be nice to know what the top half, top portion looks like. And so anytime you can send a picture of the entire plant as well as the close-up of the damage, that's a great thing to do. Uh, look at this picture. If uh, It looks chlorotic, for one thing. You got the light green to maybe darker green veins, but I, there's also the browning on the edges, which is kind of a scorch. Uh, we refer to that as scorch. Uh, what's usually scorch leaves, if it's a root-related problem, leaves will scorch, but usually it's more towards the top of the plant back down. So I'm not real sure what's going on here. I did wonder when they mentioned spraying rabbit repellent around there <coughs> if, if there could be any phytotoxicity from that. If only the lower portion of the plant looks like that, but the top half looks fine, Maybe that's the case. So I don't, it, it sounds like they're taking, you're taking care of it the way you should take care of it on the east side. You're mulching, keeping it moist. I would apply the Gladys rule, three strikes and you're out. Start over. Sounds good. All righty, problem areas in your lawn can be really difficult to keep green and lush in the heat of the summer. Perhaps you've had some tire tracks in your lawn from somebody, oops, missing the driveway. Heavy equipment that has killed your turf and has made some deep ruts. Right now we're going to hear from Bill about how you can possibly solve these problems. We frequently talk about the best time to seed is in the fall, but sometimes in the summer you'll have a catastrophic injury. Maybe it's utility work, construction at your site, and your lawn just takes the brunt of that heavy equipment. We had that, that happen here when they put some heavy equipment on this very, very saturated ground a couple weeks ago. And so we had to try to get some grass to grow back uh, in the middle of summertime. It's really hot outside, dew points 70, temperatures near 100, and this is really not conducive for growing grass, but we have to do something. So if you're in this situation, honestly the best thing to do in July establishment is to sod. Seeding is just not a great option this time of the year. The reason we say that is because uh, you have a lot of competition with weeds. We can see things like field bindweed popping up, yellow nut sedge, and then crabgrass and foxtail. There's more than just weeds though. We also have diseases like pythium blight, uh, leaf spots, brown patch, things that just like to take care of and kill out those little bitty seedlings that are popping up this time of the year. One thing that's working for you is the soils are warm, so you should have pretty good germination if you can keep it wet, which is another challenge this time of the year. 
we can use a lot, lose a lot of water with the really bright sunshine and the warm temperatures on a bare soil. So in this situation, we couldn't afford the sod. We came in and we seeded. If we're going to go, with, go through with this seeding, we have to kind of expect it's probably going to fail. You might need to do it again in August and September. But if you're going to try to do something with it, which we recommend because we don't want bare soil that can wash away in the heavy summer rains, you know, go out with a, a grass that you like and mix in some perennial ryegrass would maybe be a good recommendation because that will help to establish a little bit more quickly and it'll likely die um, and let the other grass uh, fill in, the tall fescues or the bluegrasses. Um, again, thinking you might have to reseed in, in the fall. Uh, weed control is going to be important. Something like tenacity is going to be really helpful to control the, the crabgrass and the foxtail that's going to try to pop up. And so you can put that down at seeding and it won't hurt those seedlings. And so that would be a good thing to do uh, once you go and actually see the grass. Then keeping it wet. In this situation, we use the Curlex wood fiber mat that can help retain some of that soil moisture so we don't have to be watering three or four times a day to keep that top of that soil wet. We don't need to be doing you know, inches of water, but we need to keep the top of the soil wet where those seeds are. And then finally, you know, start mowing. This is gonna be a little bit long, uh, but the sooner we can start mowing, the sooner this grass will turn into an adult and be able to handle the disease. It will put more energy into developing a nice strong root system. And so it'll give us our best chance of getting this area to recover in this stressful growing period. Sometimes a temporary solution is the best way to get you through that hot summer. Sodding might be a little on the expensive side, but that would be a more permanent solution if you can find good sod and keep the water on it. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> okay, Tom, uh, two picks for you. The first is a papillion oh. viewer uh, said, this is now in its cocoon. It wonders, uh, he wonders what it is and how long will it stay in its cocoon? Uh, Polyphemus larvae, mm -hmm. and it was eating oak leaves, potentially. They, they can eat leaves from number trees. It'll probably be in a cocoon until mm -hmm. next year. Cool. Really? It'll emerge cool, in May. Cool. And then this viewer uh, sent us, uh, these are showing up around our swimming pool. They bite or they sting. The minute the cover comes off, they start appearing. I thought you'd kind of like this one. What yeah, is they're, it? they're little pollinators, little native bees, from what I can tell from the picture. They're thirsty. They come to the pool. Sometimes pools are more attractive because they stand out odor-wise, chlorine hmm. that's in it. So they pull the cover off. They come to the water. Um, they are stinging. If you're grabbing them, uh, they're probably not seeking you out to sting you. But if you're, they're in the water and they bump up against you, they will sting. All right, excellent. All right, you had to have one, maybe a weed picture. Yeah, I'll take it. <laughs> and this, this particular viewer has this uh, coming up in a newly seeded lawn. Last, I think he seeded it last fall, as I recall. Yeah. Yeah, with, and used straw. Yeah, and so this yeah. is alfalfa. Uh, at first we had looked at it and we thought it was a weed, and then we, you know, Matt Sochik told us it's alfalfa, and we're like, yeah, of course it is. Um, and so it probably came in the, uh, in the straw, and so it's, you know, it could be a perennial, if so we want to mow it frequently at lawn height, that should put a lot of stress on it. If for some reason it doesn't uh, die, um, you know, the three-way mixes of herbicides that kill everything else in the fall would probably be the, the death nail on this, so I would try that. Okay, excellent. So Lauren, two very cool shroom ones next. The first is a Douglas County location. She wonders what are these and how to get rid of them. They come back every single year. And this is some sort, I believe a bolete, but I just, there's some parts of it missing. So we need kind of the base and, and such. No way to get rid of it. It's growing on decomposing material in the soil. When its food source is totally depleted, it will be gone. That will be sometime in the next 10 years, probably. <laughs> oh, that's encouraging. And, and this, this is awesome. So okay. This uh, is your Blair. Yeah, this is really cool. So uh, at first I didn't know that I got to thinking about it. This, this is a Xylaria. Fungus is commonly called, if you look closely at this, dead man's fingers. It looks like they're coming out of the grave. <laughs> so, a uh, beautiful shot, though. Yeah. Outstanding. Yeah, and just unusual. I mean, just unusual. It's growing on some wood in the soil. Maybe a tree was okay. taken out, a stump, something, some organic material. All right. Yeah, really neat. Kelly, the, the question is, this old tree has ants eating it, but okay. you get it because it's <laughs> not the ants that are the issue. That's right. <laughs> and That's I'm right. not sure where, where this is, but you can, you can see the, the big tree there, and I think mm -hmm. we might have a close-up of, mm -hmm. of the actual wound. 
Right. So that's a large cavity, and yeah, the ants are not ca the cause of this. The ants are just taking advantage of the moisture, and the you know, it's just a great environment to nest in or crawl around in. Um, the tree obviously was wounded at some time. Probably a lawnmower, probably a weed whacker, and for some reason, it just it didn't compartmentalize the wound or the decay, and so the decay went in throughout the tree. Uh, the biggest concern, not nothing to do. The biggest concern is the structural integrity has been compromised, so okay. if it fell, what's it gonna hit? And be careful. All right, thanks, Kelly. Well, a couple of announcements of fun things in the gardening world, and the first one is snakes of Nebraska. Okay. Lauren Law. Not gonna find me there. <laughs> <laughs> Saturday, July 22nd, and Sunday the 23rd at Mahoney State Park, and I'm, I'm guessing our snake guy, Dennis, will be up there with snakes. Crawling all over him. <laughs> yeah. And the second one is produce from the heart. You can donate your extra produce every Tuesday through September. 4.30 to 6.30 p.m. Central in the Backyard Farmer Garden, which you can also enjoy while you're there. All right, we have some questions that came in from our audience. Uh, let's see here. We have a Lincoln viewer who says they have squash, several different kinds, including butternut. Is there any way to prevent squash vine borers from getting into the vines, other than the row cover that Sarah talks about? Uh, I would really keep an eye for the egg masses. Okay. So watch for the eggs, um, uh, Google it online, they're very particular the way the egg masses look, but be very vigilant about finding those on the stems and, and removing them before they hatch. Okay, all right. Um, Bill, again, this is rust on, on four-week-old hydra-seeded fescue. So whole blade is covered, the color is rust, watering is an issue, he's backed off the watering. Yeah, that, it's hard to say if it's rust colored. I mean, it could have been what Lauren was showing. They could say that was rust colored. Mm -hmm. uh, I would be surprised if it's actually rust right mm -hmm. now. It's still a little early for that. So, uh, diagnosis, but if it's four week old fescue, you really can't do a lot. Kind of what I just talked about in that segment, it's a challenge. Okay. So, this is a southern Lancaster County, and this is also butternut squash, Lauren. But uh, the vine was doing fine until yesterday, then, shoop, wilted. I, first thing I look for is uh, squash vine borer. And Actually, the second thing is, um, and then there's there are some um, some uh, fungal wilts that will hit our cucurbits also. So, look if it's a portion of the vine and you got healthy parts of the vine, squash vine borer. If it's the whole thing, probably a wilt. Okay. To Not anything to do. Okay. For wilt. Go to farmers market. Yeah. Okay. Tecumseh <laughs> viewer Kelly uh, wonders about whether weeping willow and or silver maple are good choices for trees to plant in that location. Um, they're not quality trees. Uh, both of them are very fast growing trees, which means they have weak, brittle wood. And silver maple tends to get chlorotic and willows tend to get cankers and are not real long lived. So I would uh, look for another choice. There are many better choices than that. Okay, Tom. Yes. This is a Crete viewer who wonders, is there any way to control Japanese beetles on corn silk? Uh, the best way to get rid of the Japanese beetles is to knock them off the plant into a bucket of soapy water and just be vigilant about that. They will go after the corn silks. There's a nice moisture level, so just keep after them. Okay, and hope they don't have like 2,000 acres of... <laughs> okay, now that's a different no story all the <laughs> I'm thinking in their backyard you know, for sweet corn. Okay, Bill, we have about 30 seconds. Sure. Um, and I know it's bindweed season. Uh -huh. This person wants to know, is there a, an organic way to kill bindweed short of... Bindweed is a, is a real barrier to control, even with our, our chemicals. I, I'd have a real hard time. It's such an aggressive uh, plant to control, and, and things that we control, crabgrass actually control it, but that's not an organic option. So, mm -hmm. not, much, not many good options, unfortunately. So it's my it's, bane, weed as it is. Yeah. Well, and again, it's one of the ones I keep saying, uh, you know, an enterprising horticulturist would come up with an ornamental. We had it growing uh, up the side of our shed five feet today. <laughs> five feet. <laughs>